Yeah, let's say something so our audience knows we're, at least what some of us are here. This program is live streamed on YouTube where viewers can post questions in the chat. Room. And Jordan will uh, monitor those questions and ask them of the speaker on your behalf. People in the room with me are asked to silence your cell phones. Today, Doug Samuelson and Eva Lou will discuss the threat of misinformation to public health uh, and what might be done to counter this problem. Samuelson is president of InfoLogix, a small consulting firm in Washington, D.C. area, specializing in national security and emergency response preparedness. He holds a doctorate in operations research with, uh, with numerous publications in that field. He is active in the American Statistical Association and the Military Operations Research Society, among others. He is first vice chair of the advisory board of the Health Systems Agencies of Northern Virginia. Lee has a doctorate in applied math and medical training in oncology. She, is a special, she has specialized in large-scale networks and epidemiological modeling. She is the director of the Whitaker NSF Center for Operations Research in Medicine and Healthcare and chief scientist at the Data and Analytics Innovation Institute. Lee is a subject matter expert on medical and public health information sharing enterprises and has been a leading advisor for Homeland Security and other major U.S. federal government agencies. Doug and Eva, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you all for coming, and I'm, I'm glad to hear Eva's voice. How you doing, Eva? Hi. Good. Yeah, put her, her face on there. She, she's better looking than I am. <laughs> okay, good. Are, are we ready to start, Spencer? Please, start. Okay, well, as you will see from the uh, references slide I will eventually show, I've been very careful not to rely on slides for this presentation because it's going to turn into an audio only event and i've learned the hard way that when i have slides i get a little bit lazy about explaining what things are and where they came from and then if people don't have the slides they they'll have trouble following it so i'm not going to do that in 1995 i wrote an article for ormS today which is a publication of informed to national operation research society of us suggesting that information problems were the number one driver of both cost problems and quality problems in healthcare. And that was not universally uh, applauded at the time. People uh, said, how do you know something like that? I mean, yeah, it's an interesting conjecture, but do you have any evidence? I also had a few people who worked in clinical settings kind of sidle up to me, look both ways to see who might overhear and say, you don't know how right you are. And they told me all kinds of stories about lost test results, miscommunication among providers, uh, just all kinds of things. And this is normal healthcare. It's just not a crisis time. In normal healthcare, a lot of information gets lost. A lot of information gets misstated. And then when you have an epidemic of some kind, some pathogen is out there. The classic model is you have differential equation uh, descriptions of how the pathogen spreads. The fact is that in a real epidemic, what you have is a race. The pathogen spreads, but information and response also spread. And whether you have a pandemic or a 
dodge the bullet, depends on who wins that race. Most models of epidemiological phenomena, mathematical models do not really take that into account or have not taken that into account. There's been kind of a boom in modeling epidemiology for the last few years for some odd reason. And uh, therefore, when we look at how something spreads and what ought to be done about it, there's model, model, model. Okay, now let's let's talk. Analysis, judgment, what do we do and how will it work? One of the things we have learned in the last few years, we, we have information flows that are critical to responding to an epidemic like this one, COVID-19. If somebody, for whatever reason, wants to harm our country, wants to harm Western society or whatever, one of the things they can do is tamper with those information flows. Now, who would do a thing like that? Who would ever think of tampering with the information flows of a competing society to mess up their government and make that government look worse, actually produce worse results? And that's part of the competition. Well, just about everybody who ever thought about competition among governments. There are stories going back certainly into the uh, 18th century or so about centuries deciding, and in one case, the Britain decided whether to do a census. Some of the lords were against it because if we, we put out an accurate count of how many of us there are and where we are, we're giving information to an enemy who might want to attack us. In 1918, what was the great influenza became known as the Spanish flu, not because it started there, not because really any significant role of it was in Spain, but Spain was the first country to report it accurately. Everybody else in Europe was engaged in World War I, and nobody wanted to give out information about how many of their people were sick, especially their military, because that might be useful information for the enemy didn't start then either. The famous victory of Washington and Lafayette over Cornwallis at Yorktown in 1781. One of the reasons Cornwallis surrendered was that a third of his men were out on sick call. The most deadly weapon the colonists had was the M1A1 mosquito. A lot of the Brits were sick, typically with malaria, and it drastically reduced their fighting effectiveness. And again, this is one of those things, you, if you're a car in Wallace, you don't want to advertise that. So we know that information and misinformation about medical situations can be very, very important to international con conflict. And now we know also the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS is the way we usually refer to it around Washington, is a think tank in Washington, D.C., very highly regarded, very influential. There was a time when I was young, like during the Nixon administration, when the most influential think tank in the country was the Brookings Institution. People were known to go from senior economist at Brookings to chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors or office manager of the uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget. It was like a shadow government over there. Well, Brookings is still a highly regarded institution. It doesn't have quite the clout it used to have. And the revolving door between think tanks and government has been more Center for New American Security on the more liberal side. Center for Strategic and International Studies. There are a couple of others. Anyway, CSIS is pretty middle of the road. They got involved about eight years ago now in looking at what the Russians were doing to spread their influence and undermine their competition in Eastern Europe. We put out a re report in 2016 called the Kremlin Playbook, 
where they collaborated with the Center for the Study of Democracy in Bulgaria and looked at all the ways that Russians were investing in banks and key industries in Eastern and Central European countries, and then using that in economic leverage to cultivate political influence, and in many cases to support candidates more favorable to Russia. One of the reasons that the timing of that report was significant was CSIS is studiously nonpartisan. They want to stay out of partisan politics. But if you read their report carefully and saw what the Russians were, could be documented to be doing in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, it wasn't that big a stretch to say, well, gee, are they doing some of those things here? Or in particular, are the Russians putting together troll farms to put out misinformation about American political candidates who might not be as, as favorable to Russia or as helpful to Russian policy as others. 2016, <laughs> many of you may have heard we had a presidential election that year. And in 2020, they put out an update, Kremlin Playbook 2, in which they laid out more of what was then known about what the Russians and others had been doing, but especially Russia, to undermine liberal democratic capitalist institutions around the world, to, to undermine faith in governments, to tilt in favor of more authoritarian governments or Communist, no, not communist, they're not communists anymore. Uh, authoritarian, totalitarian leaning politicians in various places, including the US and the other kind of politicians they like are the ones who are not openly friendly to Russia, but would be ineffectual in opposing them. Sometimes their, their best uh, help in competing countries are fascists because people react against the fascists and then Russia looks like a better alternative. This strategy was originally proposed by Stalin, I believe. Our best allies are the right-wingers in the countries we're trying to oppose. So now along comes COVID. And one of the reasons COVID has spread so far so fast is that there's been persistent misinformation circulated about what to do and what's going on. That misinformation has come from multiple sources. China has been less than open and candid about what originally happened and about what might, the nature of the pathogen and how it's spread. There was a lot of mistrust of China in the U.S. anyway, so anything that came out was, was fodder for somebody to make a big deal about how they're doing this to us. This is the Chinese virus, and it's all part of a Communist Party plot. The truth is a bit more mundane and in, in some ways a lot more frightening. In 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, George W. Bush decided to take a couple of weeks and go study and contemplate and recharge his intellectual batteries a bit. One of the things he read was John Barry's book on the great influenza, 1918 flu. He came back and said, we've got to do more to detect and respond to the development of new organisms, which tends to happen in the underdeveloped under-resourced countries of the world. So at his initiative, the U.S. funded a few dozen monitoring and detection and response facilities in the world, mostly in third world countries, some, some in developed countries, but still could use help like China. One of those facilities was in Wuhan. Obama expanded that program. I think 42 of them when Trump came into office and Trump said, I'm a businessman. In business, we run lean and mean. We don't retain slack capacity, that's waste. If we need something, we go buy it when we need it. Evidently he'd never 
taking a good look at a fire station. In an emergency response, what looks like slack capacity in normal times is known as response capacity when there's a crisis. When your house has caught fire, it's a little late to go out and buy a fire engine. Just in time doesn't work in emergency response. Well, he defunded a lot of those overseas facilities, one of which was in Wuhan, or at least he cut a lot of funding, he cut staff. Um, that left us more vulnerable to being blindsided by a new organism. In 2020, the Scowcroft Institute at Texas A&M did uh, a large study based on expert uh, judgments. How would you respond to an outbreak? Are, are we vulnerable to a major infectious outbreak. And at the time, there were other reports indicating that the U.S. was the best prepared country in the world to respond to an outbreak. But those reports were based on things like, do you have, asking people, do you have enough facilities to handle X, Y, Z, but no tests? This is like asking the captain of an, oh, captain of an ocean liner, do you have enough lifeboats if the ship hit an iceberg? Captain's going to say yes. Did you do a lifeboat drill? If you didn't do a lifeboat drill, you don't find out how many of the lifeboats leak, how many of the lifeboat winches jam, how many of the passengers won't know how to get to the lifeboats that have capacity in a crisis. You don't know by asking people how ready they are. You know by testing. And not much testing was going on, and Scowcroft Institute pointed that out. They also pointed out that communication is key. The most important thing you can do in response to an epidemic is a coherent, credible flow of communication from government. So people trust what they're hearing and what they're hearing is actually helping them. That was all there in January of 2020. By May of 2020, one could write an article, and I did, for Global Peace Services. Somebody had asked me in the fall of 2019, we had met at a forum on nuclear proliferation, and I said, you know, bio is a much bigger threat than nuclear. And this person was the editor of the Global Peace Services now, newsletter. I said, really? Can you prove that? So I wrote this little article showing how, how vulnerable we were. And that looked prescient because two, two months later, here came COVID-19. So I got this phone call, can you write an update? And I did, still trying to be very nonpartisan, non-advocacy, uh, non uh, just here's what the experts said we should be doing. Okay, now this is May of 2020. Here's what Scowcroft Institute and other experts, they called on and other experts. I, I relied mostly on Scowcroft Institute's report because it seemed to be the best one. The most comprehensive one that was available is what they said we should be doing. You decide for yourself whether it looks like we're doing that. And of course, <clears throat> we were not. So we now know if the COVID-19 was not a deliberate biological attack by an adversary. And as far as I can tell, most people who've looked at the situation carefully competent people have concluded that it was not. It was a natural outbreak, a jump from an animal somehow, which is the most common way that these kinds of epidemics start. Could have been in that wild animal market, in a food market in Wuhan, or it could have been a lab animal in the uh, biological laboratory the Chinese ran that somehow it got loose without anyone deliberately doing so. It could have been an accident, unlikely an accident, to be a lab accident. The virology suggests that it was a wild animal and probably not one that had, didn't match that well to the DNA of the animals Chinese admit to having had. Whatever. Let's say that it was a natural, spontaneous jump from an animal. We just gave any want wannabe adversary a, a clinic, a really fine demonstration of how to do it to us if they wanted to. 
we showed them every vulnerability we have to an outbreak and every worse worse than optimal, in some cases just worse <laughs> response we could come up with. If somebody wanted to attack us now, we showed them how. Which means we have this problem. What do we do about all this misinformation going around out there? There's an anti-vax movement, there's an anti uh, masking movement. Almost every public health measure anybody has proposed becomes a political issue. You've got people personally attacking the integrity of Anthony Fauci on the floor of the United States Congress as if that's going to help. You know, he lied to us and he's responsible and he, he did all this stuff wrong. Much of this can be traced and shown to be coming from troll farms in Russia as part of a coordinated campaign to undermine confidence in our government. And it's certainly not limited to the epidemic. Now, what do we do about this? We've got another epidemic threatening us right now. It's an epidemic of misinformation. What do you do about epidemics? The physical kind. First of all, you try to detect better. You try to detect outbreaks early and respond to them quickly. The other thing you do is try to immunize people. You give people an idea, well, at the physical level, the cellular level, you give them a weakened dose of the pathogen you expect they may encounter. If their bodies manufacture immune response to that pathogen, so then when the real one comes along at full strength, they have enough immune response to counter it. This is how vaccination works, and it works very well. We don't have smallpox in the world anymore. We don't have a whole lot of polio in the world. The few exceptions are places where people didn't go along with, the, for whatever reason, with the vaccination program. We don't have a lot of yellow fever in the world. Another thing you can do is try to squelch the sources. One of the reasons we don't have a lot of malaria in the United States, and there's no vaccine. It's, it's uh, still a very potent pathogen. It's a tremendous cause of death in Africa. But here we spray ponds for mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes that spread malaria don't get to breed and circulate among our population very freely. That's another thing you can do. So detect, squelch, respond. These are things we can do with misinformation as well. We all need to become, we in the Western world, not just the US, need to become smarter consumers of information. And one of the things we know about information is that if you decide to live in an echo chamber, you get all of your information about major events from one source, whatever it is. I don't care whether that source is One American News Network or the news, the New York Times or public radio. If you're getting only one source, it is easier for somebody to come along and manipulate your understanding of what's going on in the world. The way good intelligence analysts do things is always get multiple sources. There's a firm rule in journalism that you don't publish a story until you've got two independent sources for it, just so that somebody can't put a bug in your ear and cause a sensation with misinformation. We can all do that. Multiple sources and multiple Diverse sources give you a better picture of what's going on and make you more immune to being manipulated by one set of rumor mongers. Okay, well, that's my rant for the day. Uh, there is more to be said, certainly in terms of the specifics of how COVID has spread, how misinformation has contributed to that, some of the things we could do. Well, you, you are fortunate today to have a, a presentation to you by two people who between them know everything about the subject. And now I'm going to hand it over to the person who knows all the things I don't. Eva, take it away. Thank you. So I'm going to go with the old-fashioned way is that I will actually include the slides. And yet I think it 
some pay for the audios that yeah. like when we talk about things that I think they can follow through to. So I'm gonna share um share my screen. I'll, can you give me access like, to share my uh screen, please? Thank you. There we go. I see it. Hey, yeah, let me. It's it's on the side. I need to move it. Oops. Okay. Let's be careful. I've had some experience with uh, Zoom. I try to move my screen and it breaks the connection. <laughs> right. Are we good? So everybody can see it, I suppose. And so I will now dive I see a in. black screen. Huh? Still there? Now I see a black screen. I don't see anything. You see a bad black oh, screen? Wait a minute. Ne ne never mind. That was we fine. see it here. Okay. It's fine. It's it's good. It's good. Never mind. Thank you. So I will um talk a little bit about the public health and information challenge. Like I think most of the stuff that um, Doug has already alluded to, some of these, really the key is it's not just really about public health itself. It is really about anything, right? I mean, so event and about anything that you look at, there will always be multiple sources. A lot of times, conflicting information, contradicting information. There are multi-media that you could access to, multiple actors. And with that, there are people that indeed sending out or feeding new information. There are also secondary actors that actually just spread information. Like it is is basically be by liking things or by retweeting or by reposting. And maybe the really key part that is different now than before is that it's it's in lightning speed. It's so fast that. In one second, you got this information, but in the next second, you get something contradicting. And that is really confusing, even to decision makers, policy makers, and not to mention about to the mass public, is that you have to be able to decipher that rapidly and pick up what threads you would like to follow. So I want to show a little bit about this um, model, and I hope you can see, I have a lot of like little little things from the Zoom stuff. Can you see the screen without any of the Zoom things on it? Is the screen pretty clear to you? The, the, the so, screen is clear. Your image is, uh, is a, a thumbnail on the upper right, but that's fine. Continue. Yeah, can I? Yeah, I like to have everybody being able to see all of this because I think this is important. Whether you want to think about disease or like any any type of infectious disease, is that you can see is that this is the disease model. And this is like really the, I'm looking at like just specifically COVID, but you know, susceptibility, exposed, infectious, and whether they have symptoms or not. And then they they recover, whether they remain infectious, they are immune or they are not immune, right? So you can represent a very good uh, type of, uh, different type of infectious disease using this. And of course you can put different, Browse to it. But then layering this is the uh, human behavior. As we notice is that things don't just spread if there are no humans, there are no animals, there are no carriers. And so it is the actors, right? That is the human behavior, the social environment is heterogeneous and how things really spread. And then there is the, there are the interaction or the intervention. So what do you what will you do if there is an infectious disease that like the you can start social distancing, wearing face masks, washing hands, or you start doing diagnostic tests to people, you quarantine people. So all of these are actions. So you can see like the events of the biological nature, the human and the environment interacting, and then the actions that are taken. If you look at this one, amazing, because this is precisely how information can also be spread, like right, precisely in the same manner. And looking at that, you can see the like this is what we are looking at. It's like you're looking at the systems itself within any society, any population, whether it is just a business or a pop small single population in a city or in a little, just even within a block, 
or whether it is within the whole country. So a lot of these you can model it in many different ways. But then why do people use different type of information and what really gives them the motivation? Right. So a lot of times, indeed, during disasters, you tend to like send out information because that's your goodwill and unintentional. There may be something that happened that turned out to be misinformed and misguided. A lot of times information is being, being sent out or spread is because of revenue and uh, because you want to influence others. And that's like, you know, politicians do that, influencers on web do that because they like to be able to control others. And really controlling, you think about in the war time is a big part of it. So you want to really dominate over what is the next action and whether the public or the population is supporting you or not. In the same manner, election, it's not like a war, in a, in a sense, hostile war, but the election itself is competition, right? So that's the control. And it is from the point of view of the um, during war, that is the adversaries that want to create chaos and build distrust among and within the government itself so that you want to be able to really take advantage of those chaotic situations. And really the worst thing is that the adversaries lead to like self-destruction, right? I mean, that's really, you think about offense and defense. And in a war game, of course, we can understand it because we see that now in real time, like in, in terms of the war situations and everything. Now, if I look at the situation, you notice that this is precisely the same biological behavior intervention uh, framework. But now, instead of looking at the intervention that is the medical intervention, you are looking at the counter countering misinformation and disinformation about social distancing. To some extent, it's the same thing. You put yourself in a cave. You are not like exposed to all the chatters and everything, so you can build your own understanding or you expose yourself to all the uh, information and you really do fact checking or you look at different things and trying to, to perform critical understanding to really try to figure out which one should I choose what believe in and, and how much trust is this that I should be using and what is the credibility and everything. And we understand this, so it's never easy. If one thing we look at public health, the challenge of the COVID that we see is that Everything about intervention is very difficult because you do not get consensus. And it is hard for people to all rally at, like, like, like to us or just one single thing and say, I all, we all agree with. So I want to show you, this is the information spread and from different sources. I want to show you how things can get out of control and, and that misinformation can become really the main play. Like, to some extent, the main type of information that people are getting. So suppose this is like one particular venue um, for people to come up with information and that the mass, like like we all, uh, like the population, suppose, are all looking at it. So you can see that at the start, that's the start of this information. And then, and then things get, like people are trusting, some people pick it up and believe in it. And then over time, some of the people think, well, it's not really true. And 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 some of these people left the like like believing in this information now. Now we look at a second one, more popular, more trustworthy information. And the moment the information comes out, rapid intake by a like more than half the population. And and then again, over time, then people realize that against other facts that this. The information may not be so correct, and then, like some some of the the individuals uh, realized that and left that uh, cocoon of like misinformation. Now, more now, so you notice that it is a cumulative effect, right? It's not like one media is going to say one, but you talk about like many different players, and I'm looking at the misinformation part, and some are deliberate, some are just really unintentional. Unfortunately, this could be a very influential. Um, organization or individual and with huge number of followers. And the moment these individuals tweet something or, or post something, huge number of people take it. It's sustained for quite 
bit of time. Not only that, because this information come in and overlap with the others. People think more medias and, and they could build more trust. Now, look, fact checking is just that. You could have all the fact checkers, like every one of them also have misinformation. And then your fact checking turned out to be not correct. So now you can see what is happening. Look at the tail. So the idea of misinformation is no big deal. It is only big deal when it sustains and that people are not letting it go and that those misinformation become facts. Right? They become quote unquote facts among a large group of people. And so that's what I want to show you. And this is the cumulative effect, right? It's a large group of individuals believe in the information and that you cannot write it off anymore. So I think that's that's a very uh, critical part. I want to show you just like two more slides and then we will be done here. And basically, if you look at COVID, it's that we are best plan, true. But planning does not mean execution. And I think that is precisely what fails. It's the last step. It's the last mile. It's how do you execute it, the response correctly and when do you take at in timely manner. So US has the most number of ICU yeah, units and also hospital beds. And we also spend the most amount in healthcare. But yet we rank 200 out of the world 219 countries on COVID deaths per capita. So that's really a, um, a serious problem, right? If we think about this, we are hurt by misinformation external as well as internal. If we think about this is COVID and this is war between us and this is us, this is really the key part. Some people try to make COVID into a political alliance thing. And because of that, we work so hard and fight among ourselves instead of really spending all our information and be united in really fighting the virus. And I think that truly is a, a huge failure. But I want to say something about, um, like, I, I think those COVID things, uh, information. Misinformation really has huge consequence, which we know, right? Societal damages and consequences. But I think most importantly is the, it's the part where we think about is the distrust and negative impact to the society and, and truly the disruption. And it could endanger lives. It threatens our democracy and it threatens really the homeland security. Now, I want to say two things here. I want to link with this system event to the what is going on um, in the about the information. So this is about something happened, event happened. So when I was in uh, Japan, Fukushima, like that's the um, nuclear disasters on the ground, lots of good citizens, good, like, you know, really they have good hearts and they try to give us information. And those information is really difficult to decipher because they could conflict and they are confusing. So there's an like, event happening. There's a lot of sources that, that come in, a lot of data. How do we decipher that? And how do you harmonize them? How do you monitor them? And how do you create the uh, information literacy for the people? But then once these events are being reported, data is going to stream in. And this becomes really difficult because they are the quality and credibility issue. How do you build, build trust about this data? How do you even trust the data that feed into you as a data scientist to actually just analyze it and, and put it into graphical representation for individuals to be really looked the important thing is really the how do you actually hold of this data once the like all this massaging of information has been done, it's being pushed out. You look at it, you listen to it, it's all through social media. I think that part is really difficult. And you notice that I keep the resistance, the resilience here, and and because it is really. The beginning and at the end, you need to know all of this, right? Because that's the individual. That's why it is always there. Whatever that is happening to the event, the people, the human is already in the loop. So that means as the event unfold, be unfold before everybody is going to send out information, you start thinking about, you, right? you start doing the critical thinking about what is going on. The social media here is amazing because 
that's the part that where you could say, look, I'm not going to listen to social media of any form. Or I'm going to like distance myself from it. Or that I am going to listen, but I'm going to fact check and whatever, I guess as you mentioned, like right? you can fact check in any way you want using using different type of source. But truly it is not easy. And, and as you notice, there are lots of overlap during this process. And the human is always in the loop. But the most difficult part, as I see it, is the human. Because what does that mean, critical thinking? When somebody tells you something, your best friend tells you something, will you listen or will you not listen, right? So it is not just like advertisement. It becomes so personal. Now, I'm going to take a totally opposite approach now. Is that I started with the event and the individual. What if it is like this? Individual starting information and that it gets to the culture. You can look at it totally reverse, right? The cultural and the cultural spread to the through social media and then organization pick it up. And then the governance use those information and set up regulations and everything. Of course, you can do a lot of combinations of this and a lot of hybrid. And I think that really shows you our challenge is that it's non-stopping. It's from every angle and from every level. It's no longer top-down, like horizontal. It is from any directions. And that, that means your critical thinking has to be constant. And so thank you. I think I just want to mention this and let you guys think about our challenge. And I'm sure you have your personal experience and, and there's a lot that uh, we can discuss. Okay, so we're uh, thank you very much. So uh, it's time. It's time to um, to uh, collect uh, request donations to cover the cost of the facility and the staff time needed to support these programs. Your donations keep the farm farm streaming each week. Instructions for how to donate online should appear in the chat. Checks um, can be mailed to All Souls. Um, UU Church at 4501 Walnut Street, Kansas City, Missouri, 64111. And um, please mention the form in the memo line of your checks. Now, if you have a question, and I see we have one question, please come to the microphone to ask your question. Speak clearly into the microphone. People watching you via YouTube Live should be able to put questions in the chat. One question per person, please, until everyone has had an opportunity to ask a question and please no speeches we uh, prefer to make better use of our the time of our speakers now might be a good time to put up the one slide that i turned in with it gives you the uh, the references okay good so uh anamika can you uh can you put up that one slide of, of the uh, actually, of the actually the, there may be more than one slide there i'm not sure but well the, the reference slides you need to find them anyway Display, yeah, when, whenever. Hi. Um, what is your reaction to misinformation regarding mental health issues, such as myths about psychiatric drugs or the myth that uh, LGBTQ people can change through so called conversion therapy? Everything I said about misinformation regarding physical pandemics multiplied by about 10,000 and on steroids applies to mental health. Mental health is information central. And uh, of course, one of the problems with uh, any kind of assessment of reaction to mental health is just getting good information about what's going on with the individual. If you go into the doctor and you say, doctor, I think I have cold. And the doctor looks up your nose and he says, well, your uh, nasal membranes are, are blue, not red. You don't have an infection. This is allergies. You're not going to shake the doctor's opinion once he's had a chance to take a look at you. There are physical symptoms he can evaluate. If you walk into your doctor and say, I think I have depression, or I don't think I have depression, your self-evaluation is part of your diagnosis. In, in, in more serious mental illnesses, anosagnosia, nice, nice 50 cent Greek word for you, 
I don't know, lack of awareness of your own mental state is one of the features of the disease. And it is extremely difficult for a good therapist to tease out what's really going on. Now, put this on a society level. We don't know what's happening. We don't know why people are doing what they're doing. We don't know whose self-assessments to trust. It's a mess. It's a mess. And Fuller Tory is one of the big experts on serious mental illness. He said in one of the, in his book, one of the many editions of his book, Surviv Surviving Schizophrenia, if I had taken my most disorganized patient and asked him or her to come up with a plan for restru restructuring our mental health, public, public health response, he couldn't have done worse than what we have. So there's, there's my response to it. It's, it's a mess. Um, it's not improving. Yeah, I think mental health has always been challenging. And I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of times, truly, even among um, doctors and hospitals and facilities, it's that they do not all have a unified way to treat patients or the same type of drugs or the same advice. And I think that is really the, the premise and foundation of what misinformation can you know, someone intentionally do it can really use that to their advantage, right? Whenever there are differences in how mental health is being diagnosed or treated or even being viewed, then somebody could use that to say, well, they are not giving the right treatment or something because there are differences. But I think, you know, the, the key part is really like, I think it is very difficult for us to really, like everything about the brain, right? As I mentioned, the critical thinking is not easy to really say there is one thing, there's one information, and that is the truth. And I think it is, it is all challenging. And so at the end of the day, it's really the perception of the individual, how they actually really see things and how they uh, understand and how they act upon it that will really really influence the harm of conditions, especially about the brain. So. Psychosis is defined as a disconnection between the person's perception of reality and reality, as we understand it, which means that it's really a disconnect between the person's perception of reality and the perception of other people around them, society as a whole. In times like these, if you were wondering whether you're psychotic, what standard would you compare yourself against to decide whether it, it, me or is, is the rest of the world going on the lots? I, I think that's very difficult. When, where are you in circumstances where you could be pretty confident that if you see it differently from everybody else, it's something wrong with you? Not in the United States of America in 2023. Eva, I have a question for you. So when I look at this misinformation relative to the epidemic, we can go back to the flu epidemic in 1917-18, right? And yes. there were protests during that time about mask wearing. There were people who refused to wear the mask. I'm trying to look at, but of course it was much more significant in this time period. So I was trying to look at what's different in those two time periods and then how we counter this information, which is here to stay, right? Because we have this rapid dissemination now, we have a lack of trust in our leadership. So we have these, mm -hmm. and we have multiple messages, all of which are true at various points, uh, some of mm -hmm. which are never true, of course, but how right. do we counter that misinformation now? Can we raise the yeah. camera on, on that lectern just a little bit? I'm, I'm seeing so the questioner stomach and not his face <laughs> thank you this i think you you asked a perfect question and and so let's really think about we do not need a pandemic playbook from 2019 to actually help us to respond to the covid 2020 or 20 19. Okay, we don't even need a modern days because what has happened to COVID repeat exactly the same as 1918 Spanish flu. It's amazing. I mean, because at that time, the virus spread, okay, again, started from somewhere, not in the United States. And that is what we are going to see most of the time in the pandemics because of the interaction, you know, all sort of things that are unique to other countries. But yet, 
what what did we not have at that time? We had no diagnostic tests. We don't have definitive treatment. We do not have a vaccine to protect people, right? And what was the first reaction is that the um, government is face mask. In fact, there were um, news that you could find. There were news they say, if you don't wear a face mask, you will be in jail. And so they actually, now at that time, how did we actually overcome the manufacturing crisis? All the, all the women, all the housewives and up making face masks, everyone massively, and they were able to disseminate that to the public. And that is the beginning of the protection that worked beautifully, right? Face masking. If somebody say, well, now this is interesting part. You, like I say, you ask a really perfect question. Then somebody all of a sudden in 2020 say, oh, face mask is not working. What does that mean? So you're talking, you are telling us that the doctors were all wrong. For like more than a hundred years, they were protecting themselves in the hospitals from infectious disease by wearing face masks every day, right? What evidence do we need? Right? So, so that is the very odd thing about what is happening. Is that somebody would say, oh, face mask is not use, use, like useful, and then it just spread like fire. But spreading of rumors back in the Roman Empire, right? In the 18th century, people were doing just that. But the oddest part here is that. The, not only the spread, spread of information is so fast, it's that it is also by innocent or like right, unintentional, innocent people can just do as much harm as the bad actor. So that's the most important part because I am most certain the people that spread the information about mask is not working or you do exactly opposite to what CDC told you, they have no bad intention in mind to some extent. It's just that they just don't think that they should be controlled, right, by the government's information. They don't want to be controlled, right? So, like, they, they see the government as an adversary instead of as a speakers and, and what's that, an alliance. But like I said, that's why your, your question kind of linked everything together, right? And, and that's almost like all of a sudden when there's a pandemic, we start fighting a war among ourselves because we have so much anger among ourselves already, right? So that's like a trigger point. Now you Thanks. just got to a perfect object lesson in how innocent spread of misinformation can happen. One of the first things Eva said was that the 1918 flu started overseas. More recent studies indicate that it originated in Kansas. And the big spread vector was American troops, especially the training camps where they were all interacting closely. You know, the truth about anything does not necessarily come out immediately. Why were public health officials in the United States reluctant to recommend masking at first with COVID? Because in 2015, there was an epidemic called MERS, a very similar organism, mostly in Korea, mostly in Seoul. And everybody was masking. And they figured out that really masks weren't doing much good. This was spread mostly by contact with surfaces. And the most important thing you could do was wash your hands frequently. And that's the information that CDC and NIH were putting out for the first two months of the epidemic. Masking isn't all that important. Hand washing is. And then we found out that it transmitted in deep respiratory droplets and the guidance changed. You don't always know. Could you a comment that before you go too far on MERS. I was there. Okay, it is not just in, I, I was actually helping South Korea on that. And I was too. also dealing with the Middle East, like in, in the Middle East, and I was also in UK. Trust me, you absolutely want to mask. It really works. Okay, so I think, I think that is already a misunderstanding there. Is that in fact, the way we stopped the MERS actually getting like in, in, in South Korea, actually even in the hospital is precisely making every single person mask. And of course, washing hands is part of it. They have to. And, and, and that's why I think, you know, I don't understand what, what the misinformation about, but there could be a, a problem with supply chain also protecting the healthcare workers. But, but that's just, just, I just want you to, talk, to know about the MERS, okay? All but one of the fatalities in Seoul were emergency room transmissions, mostly hand-to-hand -hand contact. It was not respiratory. 
Well, interestingly enough, the um, Huxley and Orwell had a variation on 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 how they control people, and uh, Orwell was uh, saying he could you could control people through fear. Huxley, on the other hand, uh, control people thought we control people by mass information by by confusing them. And in the, your line curve that you talked to was most impressive. And, uh, the the bell curve short, and then they they it goes to the common knowledge area. Uh, but the but the elevation. Uh, how do you suppose that the the elevation of the accumulative can go down by attacking mass information and and confusion by by our society? How do you suppose that could occur? So I think I think the like one of the things that I really always like to to say is look at what Sigma Freud has talked about about psychoanalysis. At the end of the day, everything is about human perception. So somebody could say something outrageous, and somehow very few people will pick it up, right? Gradually, when there are lots of people start saying about the same thing in different shape and form, then that becomes really dangerous. And uh, and and now the oddest part is that, of course, people are fighting information war with more information. <laughs> 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 information from other venues. Now, the church, to some extent, the venues we are looking at now is, is it's an interesting part. IV, prevention of HIV, so being able to ask the high-risk people to come and do testing and also receive early treatment, preventive treatment, was, to some extent, church-like uh, success, okay? Because they are able to reach out to the population that people trust them. Right. So now it becomes more important. These community leaders become really essential and important in terms of how they actually could be a little bit more proactive in providing their population or the people that are close to them the information that really are true and trying to really, quote unquote, change the perception of people. It is very difficult because just like advertisement, and what Sigma Freud was saying, if I put out advertisement, at the very best, 70% of the people will actually believe it. That's, that's the, right? That is the founding principle of advertisement, direct advertisement. And, and that's how drug companies deal with people. So this, the, the, those people, once they get used to it, it's very hard to break. But disruptive information and technology could do that, right? Anything that is disruptive could make people think a little bit different. And I think that is the challenge that we're facing. How do you disrupt that? mindset and how do you use different venues, not massive amount of it to over, overload our information. And, that, and I'm, smart way to direct. And I'm going to have to interrupt to disrupt that you know, those marvelous comments. Um I just I just heard a comment that this was the most uh uh maximum amount of information in the minimum amount of time that he's <laughs> Okay, so each week's, just a reminder, each week's program is broadcasted on KKFI at noon on Thursdays, typically 11 days later. This session with Dr. Samuelson and Lee should, in, should air April 20 at noon central on 90.1 FM or any place in the world. You can go, People can go to kkfi.org and click, click listen. If you want to share this with others, invite them to search for forum at All Souls Church YouTube channel at allsoulskc.org or afternoon on April 20, go to kkfi.org, then News and Public Affairs, then All Souls Forum, and then the threat of misinformation to public health. Next week, the forum will feature um, Michelle Irwin discussing signs of suicide, gate, gate, gatekeeper training. This will be the first of three presentations on youth suicide prevention. And now uh, the people, uh, and now our audience is invited to stay for services, which uh, begin in the Bragg Auditorium at 1045 or all via All Souls UU Church, KC YouTube channel at allsoulskc.org. And uh, we thank our speakers again and thank our audience. Thank you. Thank you all very much.
think all hazards uh, preparation and mitigation. <laughs> so, uh, Stanley McChrystal's book on risk. That's the way you manage this overwhelming flow of, of confusing information. Uh, and I will add that to the um, to the episode description when I get home. Thanks. Okay. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Happy Easter. <laughs> and, and Doug is Jewish, by the way. Yes, <laughs> I just went through there. I should have collected the ones after the church last week, but I didn't stay. Afra? Dapper. Dapper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was a good way to phrase it. Of, uh, highly informed and small amount of time. Yeah, that was that was good. I had, yeah, it's, it's not happening, but I realized even though we're not set up for it, because we have TVs in both different rooms. What does that mean? Good doing to have these people go. The attendees still talk with the speakers and they do it physically. They don't. Yeah, we have it do all. We have it that we can get to you. That would be. Because that would require. Yeah, they just want out from our A, B, C, and then. Yes, but they could do it real fast with the. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. she could very interestingly set up a lot of problems. For. Yeah, a lot of this. Yeah. It's just a quick meal for us. Who knows what it's going to be? Yeah, I think I left. Yeah, okay. You, you may recall that we scheduled something else for this time, and then they didn't show. And then, and then there was a discussion on 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 email list, and I said, "Well, yeah, Chris Samuelson and Lee can talk about this." Yeah. Yeah. You know? Watch one second. I was just saying to him. You know, we always do it when we have this physical uh, speaker physically in the room, but it's we already have two Zoom rooms for the church. It's literally just telling. For this audience, if they want to walk to the meeting for anyone that's online, you just click one of the two Zoom links on the All Souls page, and you can have these speakers meet you in that room. And you can go into the other rooms for wire, I guess, only if they have. Okay. You could do it if you want to have something. But I tell you what, that was just some food of delicious stuff. Did y'all stop the one we see? We want to make one guy stay. And then we also want to make three. And I can make the three. Yeah, we need it. Oh. I encourage people to do so. Because the only person that I can see, and I like it with Brad here, um, the only way we're ever going to get back is Brad out of one goes in the chat. And he does that. He's not going to show up. He's not going to show up.